Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for coming. Um, I'm really pleased to introduce uh, Liz Stoko, and her pioneering work in conversation analysis has really developed new ways to reveal the machinery of everyday talk and show how we use talk to structure our interactions in daily life. And her half-hour talk is going to focus on how we use talk as a technology um, for building and managing social organization. So what I'm hoping this gives you is a sense of how Liz's work gives us a really radically different understanding, a very practical understanding of language and its role in cognition. It's no accident that the famous um, Turing test of general artificial intelligence tests computers to see whether they can sustain a conversation, convince um, a, a human being that they are, in fact, another human being. Um, and I'm, I'm hoping that this uh, presentation that Liz is going to give you will show you really the epic scale of that challenge and also give you some new ideas and insights into how understanding talk as a technology might help us to address those kinds of questions about interaction, cognition, and human behavior. So um, I'd just like to welcome to stage Liz Doko. I'm here to talk about talk, about, as Saul said, the, the technology and the machinery behind the social interaction that drives our everyday lives um, from when we get up in the morning to when we go to bed, from our first dates through to the conversations that we have um, with our doctors or our teachers or our lawyers or whomever. So I'm going to start off by talking about what conversation analysis actually is and what it is we do. And what I want to do throughout this talk is show you why it is that we need a scientific understanding of something that you might think, well, we just do it. We all talk. We, we can understand why we might need to understand things like um, uh, brain damage that can cause the problems in the production of language. But why do we need a science of something that just seems so um, just obvious uh, to produce. So talk is something that's quite interesting because it is designed by humans for humans to understand. So talk is not like a black hole which just exists there and it doesn't exist for humans to understand. It exists because it is the thing that it is. Whereas talk is designed for shared understanding and the sort of continual production and reproduction of the world. And that's why conversation analysis sort of exists. So what is it we actually do? We start off by collecting recordings, hundreds, sometimes thousands of recordings of particular types of encounters. And then we transcribe them in a lot of forensic and close fine-grained detail. And then what we try to do is understand the complete encounter from the start and to the end. And one of the analogies that I regularly use to help people understand conversation analysis is to get them to think of any particular encounter as having an architecture to it, like a racetrack. Um, you can substitute that for a golf course if you like, but think about um, a racetrack. So we start at the beginning with our recipient or recipients, and then along the way, along any particular encounter, we complete projects of various kinds. So if you imagine yourself um, at the supermarket checkout. The things that happen at the supermarket checkout in interaction with the person behind the till are quite regular and systematic. You kind of know what to expect. There's an opening and a greeting, and there might be a conversation about whether you need bags, and then there might be something about your club card, and then there'll be um, something that a goodbye at the end, and we kind of know how that looks. Similarly, if we imagine ourselves going to see our general practitioner, we have, again, um, the same kind of projects that happen, there'll be an opening and a greeting and a why are you here and then there'll be um, maybe some questions and answers and then there might be some advice um, and then there'll be a closing. And one of the insights of conversation analysts over the last 50 years or so is to show how massively organized and systematic talk is. It's not the random messy thing that we think it is. And we have also shown over the, over the years that people are not as idiosyncratic and individual as they might like to think. So we tend to think, based on lots of research by psychologists, which is actually my home discipline, um, that we're driven to behave the way we do because of our personalities or our gender or our class or something like that. Um, whereas it turns out, when you collect hundreds of instances of the same type of conversational encounter, we tend to do the, the activities that that comprise that completer encounter in quite similar ways. 
So I'm going to start off with the most mundane and ordinary example that you can perhaps think of in a conversation, which is saying hello. And I'm going to show you what difficulties you can get into if you don't quite pick up on how someone is ready to respond to your hello. So the first example that I'm going to show you is a conversation between two friends. Um, it's American data, on the, they're on the telephone to each other, Hyla and Nancy. And what you're going to see, um, and each time I play a, a clip of data, you're going to see the same thing, which is the transcript's going to appear in sync with the audio, enabling you to live through real encounters as they happen, which is how we experience talk. We live through them as, as they happen. So here is Nancy answering the phone. Can you hear that? Maybe, don't move it again. Hello? Okay, you heard it that time. So, answering the phone, hello, it's pre-mobile, she doesn't know who it is, answering the phone. Here comes Hyla responding to that. Hi. Now, Nancy probably is going to recognize just from that voice sample who it is that she's talking to. So, she's going to redo her greeting, but you'll hear it's a bit different. Hi. Hi. So, she does another hi, and this one does both greeting again, but also we can now see that um, they recognize each other. How are you? How are you? Fine, how are you? Fine, how are you? Now, this is terribly ordinary. You might have done that yourself many times this morning when you've uh, approached someone that you know. Hello, ho, hi, how are you? Fine, how are you? Fine. There's a couple of things that I want you to notice about it. One of them is that the how are you's are reciprocated. So how are you? Fine. How are you? OK? And that's important for the next few extracts that we're going to see. Now, you might be thinking, OK, the, what, the, this is not very interesting so far. It's just people saying hello and, and how are you? And also, this is old technology. So what a, you know, does this happen, let's say, when people are on Skype? So here's me and hello? my dad. Hi. Oops. Hi. How are you? Fine. How are you? OK. Here, here's me and my dad Skyping. Hi, Liz. How are you? I'm fine, thanks. How are you? So we tend to do this regularly in lots of different settings that we're interacting in. Now you might be thinking, well, what about on like Messenger or WhatsApp or something like that? Here are some people WhatsApping, uh, sorry, Messengering. Hey, Myra, how are you? Hey, you. Typing, it's a bit slower. I'm not too bad, thanks. You? Even for the older members of the audience, songwriters know about this, how are you? So here is ELO starting one of their classic hits. Um, here it comes. Hello. How are you? Okay. So script writers know that this is the way that one starts an encounter. OK, now having built that up a little bit and got you to understand that the hello, how are you thing happens in a fairly regular way at the start of encounters, I'm now going to show you how saying hello and what immediately happens next can tell you that there is big trouble ahead in, a, in a, any given encounter. So we're going to move over now to boyfriend and girlfriend, Dana and Gordon. Gordon is being telephoned by Dana, and you're going to see before Dana has even spoken that there is trouble ahead for Gordon, OK? So here's Gordon answering the phone to his girlfriend. Hello. So there's the hello. What we might want to happen next is what normally happens next in a no trouble situation, which is, hello, hi, how are you, fine, how are you? OK, that's what we generally see at the start of encounters. So this is what actually happens next. Right. Now, this is seven-tenths of a second of silence. And this is the, the kind of detail that conversation analysts get really interested in. And I want you to particularly remember 0.7 for later, OK, when we see perhaps a more consequential kind of interaction, although maybe there isn't anything more consequential than that encounter with your, your partner. But anyway, seven-tenths of a second of silence is enough to tell us that what is unlikely to happen next is the, hi, how are you, fine, how are you? That's all it takes. And that's because when we saw Hyla and Nancy talking earlier, they were bouncing along really quickly with about a tenth of a second or less between their turns. So the fact that when things are moving slowly, we don't see this kind of delay tells us that then when we do see this kind of delay, there's probably some trouble ahead. So let's see if we're right. Let's see what Dana does next. Hello, where have you been all morning? Hello, where have you been all morning? So what we haven't got here is a hello, how are you, fine, how are you? We've got hello. It's quite hard to resist doing the hello. 
and then a question, a rather challenging question. Where have you been all morning? Now, you could imagine how this would unfold if Gordon was feeling argumentative. He might say something like, what do you mean, where have I been all morning? We're not married. I'm entitled to be where I when I'm not joined at the hip. Um, but what's quite interesting is what happens next is that he's going to push back on the challenge of Dana's question and recruit the racetrack, if you like, recruit what generally happens next in encounters as his response to Dana. Hello. Hello. And do you remember the Heidi and Nancy conversation in that position? There was just a bright hello. So he does a bright hello. Um, and then he does answer the question. Um, I've been at a music workshop. But I want you to particularly notice now at line six, the um and the little pause of six tenths of a second. So what we've got Gordon doing is hello, a bright hello, and then the little um. Now, it is true that people litter their turns at talk with ums and ers and so on, but they're not always random. They're not always about searching for the next word. They're not always buying time. Sometimes what they're doing in particular positions is marking the thing that just happened prior as inapposite. I wasn't quite expecting that to happen at this point. So the um at that point there at line six, at the start of line six and in the pause, tells us that Gordon wasn't really expecting that challenging question to happen at the start of an encounter. And he's quite right to do so, because what normally happens is, hello, hello, fire, how are you, fine, how are you, fine? OK. Next, he asks, how are you? So he's again recruiting the racetrack and going to steer past this potential trouble. I'm not going to get into the, the, the challenge of your tone. At line nine, what Gordon might be hoping for is that by now, Dane is OK again. And she just says, fine, how are you? OK? But the fact that we get five tenths of a second of silence is enough for us to know, and hopefully now we all you know, to know, that it's not going to be that kind of conversation. It's going to be something else. So the continuing saga of Dana and Gordon, you can ask us about later. Um, but for now, we're going to move on to, a, to another, another example. So in the next one, this is now office workers. So these are people who know each other as colleagues. They work in different parts of, a, of an office building. And Katie Green is answering the phone to her colleague, who turns out to be Debbie. And I want you to notice again, are we going to get these reciprocal, hello, how are you, fine, how are you, fine, types of moves. Hello, Mara, good morning, can I help you? Hello, good morning to you, it's Debbie. Hello, Debbie, how are you? All right, thank you. OK, now, this time the voices are sounding a bit strange because I've anonymised them to protect the, uh, I've, I've, I've changed the pitch to, to anonymise them. And I want you to notice a couple of other things. So we've got the hellos returned, and at line five, Kay says, hello, Debbie, how are you? The pound signs mean smile voice. So we, we know that when we smile, um, you can hear that changes our voice quality. So we can hear that she's smiling because she now knows who's, who she's talking to. And Debbie says, all right, thank you. And we'd hope now that Debbie, because she knows Katie and they have some kind of rapport, might reciprocate. And that's what she does. Bearing in mind, these are folks from the East Midlands. So they, they say, are you my duck? So she's going to use that local kind of, you, to, to elicit the, the, the reciprocal, um, how are you? Are you my duck? Yeah, not too bad. Are you my duck? Yeah, not too bad. OK. Now, all of that is building up to the next slide, which is the, 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 perhaps the, the important one that tells us something um, about the world that is important for a particular business setting that I've been studying over the past couple of years. So these are those awful cold call sales calls. This is business to business, so these aren't the ones that you perhaps get at home. But nevertheless, there's going to be a quality in this call that you'll probably recognize, which is irritating. And you're now going to know sort of scientifically and precisely quite what it is that's irritating and immediately recognizable about a cold caller. So here is um, a cold call. Um, the, the, the person being telephoned in one business is called Mark, and he's picking the phone up. And the salesperson is called John, and he's phoning from Ocom. So here are Mark and John. They don't know each other. Hello, Mark speaking. How can I help? Oh, Mark, it's John from Ocom. How are you doing this morning? OK, so the salesperson at line three. Hello, Mark, it's John from Ocom. And then the smile voice. How are you doing this morning? And there's something about that you, that you just know immediately, I don't know this person, because we haven't done that kind of recognitional bit yet. So 
what happens next is a little pause and then... Good thanks. Good thanks. So the, 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 the person being called says good thanks. But if there was a rapport built here by the how are you today that the salesperson is trained to do to build rapport with the people that he's talking to, then what we'd expect to happen is that the called person says, how are you back? We'd want that reciprocation. So what actually happens next, and I've been recording conversations for quite a long time, is the weirdest thing that I've ever seen in an encounter. So are you ready for the weirdest thing that you might ever see in a conversation? A little silence, and then bearing in mind that the called person is not asking back, how are you? This is what happens. Can't see that. So the salesperson has not been asked how he is, but nevertheless, he's so scripted, he just says, not too bad. And then he carries on trying to build rapport with the sales training manual behind him to, to get this person that he's trying to talk to on side. So this is phoning shortly after Christmas, and he goes into a very odd kind of spiel. So here it is. I suppose it's, uh, I suppose it's uh, Christmas Eve edition of memory. OK, that's a bit strange. Now. That might sound a bit strange to you, but I want to show you that there's evidence inside endogenous to the call that the recipient also finds this a bit odd. So first of all, there's a little delay, and then the next thing that comes out of the person who's been telephone's voice is this. Eh. <laughs> so talk like this provides us with a kind of natural laboratory where the, where the effectiveness or otherwise, or the recognizability or understandability of whatever you say is, is kind of in the next turn. So there, the called person, uh, and then the salesperson keeps going and it all gets a little bit painful. From now, third week into June, was it a supposed to Christmas period, lots of Christmas dues for me? Was it, was it as busy as you thought it was going to be? OK, and, and you sort of think at this point, just, just stop and get to the business of the call. And the main message that I took back to this particular organization was stop building rapport. Stop doing the thing that you have been trained probably for years to do, maybe by a psychologist, um, as a way of building rapport with people that you're trying to talk to because there's no evidence that it works because it doesn't get that reciprocation that we've seen in all of those other instances. OK, I'm going to move on now and show you a couple more examples of the kinds of things that conversation analysts try to understand, sometimes with a, a, a kind of basic interest in how does talk work in the way that we've been seeing, but sometimes with a particular sort of applied payoff to the industry or organization that we're studying. So I'm going to show you one example of some work I'm currently doing with the Metropolitan Police, who approached me to see whether I would analyze the recordings made in the field by the police when they are negotiating with a suicidal person. So we have these recordings. They're very complex, unwieldy kinds of things. And it was fairly obvious from the start that what we were after was trying to not just see that keeping somebody talking if they're threatening suicide is a good thing to be able to do, but what kinds of turns particularly seem to keep people talking in a way that if you imagine the suicidal person at the top of a spiral, what are the kinds of things that the police can do that seem to take them down the spiral and, and maybe further toward the action that they're threatening? And what are the things that the police can do that bring them back up again and further away from the thing that they're threatening to do. So in the instance that I'm going to play you, it's just a short clip. Um, the suicidal person is locked in her home. And she's the, 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 the front door is, is open, but in front of that, there is a locked grilled door. So the police can't get to her. So they can see her, but they can't get to her. And she stood. On a, on a chair, and she has a noose around her neck, and she's threatening to kick the chair away. So what we're going to see here is the police officer asking her to put both feet back on the chair. Could you just do that for me? And just stand, or put both feet back on the chair for a start. Just do that at least, please. No, it's happening. OK, so first of all, we can just see that that, that instruction is, is not working. Um, so the police is going to do something else. So here, here's the target thing that we're particularly interested in. So here is the police officer um, issuing something else, saying something else to the suicidal person. It doesn't have to happen yet, though, does it? It doesn't have to happen yet, though, does it? OK. Now, as we're going to see, this is 
a, one of the keys to one of the things that works in terms of keeping people talking. What you want to do is give the suicidal person something that they can easily agree with because it, is, it fits the course of action that they're currently in, which is not doing it right now. So we're going to see that it's easy for the, uh, the negotiator, the suicidal person, to agree with this one. So they agree with it. No, it doesn't have to happen yet. A, softly, a soft response, but nevertheless an aligned response. So having seen this that works, we're now going to see what doesn't work. And I think now you've probably learned enough about conversational analysis to, to see immediately the error that is made by the police officer in the next turn. It doesn't have to happen. It doesn't have to happen at all. It doesn't have to happen. It doesn't have to happen at all. So can you see how that's perhaps too much? It's, it's too far away from what the suicidal person is doing now and can agree with now because it challenges their very sort of very raison d'etre for doing the thing that they're doing now. It doesn't have to happen at all. It's, it's too much too soon. Yeah, and now we are having been coming back up the spiral, if you like, we're now sort of going back down the spiral. So this is just one moment in some of the research that I'm doing with my researchers at the moment to try and identify what types of turns go a down spiral and what types of turns are up spiral so that we can just finesse further the training that the police have to have these kinds of encounters. The next example is one that will be much more familiar to you probably, which is telephoning the doctors to try and get an appointment and coming away from that encounter either without an appointment or just feeling quite irritated with the surgery. So this was a study um, again, uh, approached by some GP practices who wanted to try and find out what was happening when patients telephoned the doctors, those calls that are recorded for training and evaluation purposes, and could we find something that didn't cost anything but, and wasn't to do with whether or not um, there was an appointment or wasn't, but were the kind of communication things that might improve the satisfaction of patients when they telephone the surgery. So here comes an example of something that probably doesn't need much explanation. The receptionist is answering the phone. Good morning, surgery. Cass speaking. Good morning, surgery. Evening. Hello, have you got an appointment for Friday afternoon or tea time, please? This Friday. Yeah, uh, I'm sorry we're fully booked on Friday. Okay, I'm sorry we're fully booked on Friday is the answer to the question of the appointment. The request is not met here by the receptionist. Now, what happens next is really strange in some ways. So it's as though the receptionist has heard the question, have you got the time, please? And they've said, yes, I have. Bye. And they haven't understood that perhaps something else needs to happen in response to the question like, have you got the time, please? So for the receptionist, the call is over. And I want you to kind of imagine that the receptionist is there with the telephone and she's putting the telephone down like this. And the only thing the patient can do is fight their way to sort of keep their mouth under the mouthpiece and keep themselves in the interaction to try and achieve some service. So what we're seeing here is that the burden is on the patient to kind of drive for some kind of service for themselves. So I'll play it to the end and I just want you to notice, you'll hear that the, call, the patient sounds more incredulous as they go through the call. I actually can't quite believe that the receptionist is not going to offer us something else. Right. Okay. Okay. Yeah, okay. Um, so, probably at the end here, lines 18 and 19, where the, the brackets are in overlap, what you can see is a crash between the, recep the, the receptionist at the end saying, thank you, like I think I've done any, everything that you might need, uh, and the patient saying, yeah, okay, uh, and just trying to keep noises coming out of her mouth so she can keep herself in, in the conversation. Um, but the receptionist is, is, is not going to give her what other receptionists did. So plenty of receptionists basically do this, which is to almost not recognize that they might need to offer something else. So they're saying there's no appointment, but other receptionists would say, I'm sorry, we're fully booked on Friday. Do you want me to check for next week? And that is so simple. You can't imagine that people wouldn't do it. But it's amazing how regularly people didn't do it. And what we found was, across the surgeries that we were looking at, was that when we looked at the GP patient survey, which is the national survey of patients about their surgeries, and looked particularly at the item, how satisfied are you with your experience of making an appointment, we found a perfect correlation between the amount of burden or effort, if you like, it took 
for the patient to have to push for service rather than the receptionist offering alternatives and the score about patient satisfaction. So not, what we've managed to do by looking at these calls is look under the bonnet at the engine room of, of the, those receptionist calls and find out something that we wouldn't know unless we'd looked. So imagine you are going to train receptionists in the, in the badly scoring surgeries to, to give the patients a better, better experience. What would you do if you hadn't looked to find that a very simple thing to do is simply offer an alternative appointment rather than leave them dangling in the telephone call? It's very easy to fix. What I suspect you would end up with if receptionists were trained by a professional to communicate better with patients is they would answer the phone saying hello how are you today with a smile on their voice to build rapport with patients which of course is not really going to get anybody anywhere okay my final example is how one word can change an outcome of an encounter quite dramatically so one of the things that started me looking in detail at kind of what works in encounters between professionals and the people that they're trying to serve or their clients and so on was the interesting setting of neighbor disputes. So years ago, I got very interested in neighbor disputes. And because I'm the kind of scientist who wants to capture sort of talk in the wild, I don't want to interview people about being a neighbor, I want to capture them sort of being neighbors. I was struggling to try and find settings in which I could capture people in dispute naturally, just kind of lying around there in the world already waiting for you to just come along with a camera. And what I ended up looking at was people telephoning community mediation services uh, to, to talk about potentially resolving their dispute with their neighbor. And what was really interesting about these particular services is that no one knows about them, very mostly. And if you've got a dispute with your neighbor, you don't really want a mediator. What you want is the police, a lawyer, the council. You want your neighbor arrested, evicted. And basically what we tend to want as human beings in a dispute is to be told you're lovely and they're horrible, you're reasonable and they're unreasonable. And they don't really want a mediator to come along and say, we don't take anybody's side, we get you together and sort of effect a compromise. That isn't really what a lot of humans want when they're in a dispute. So, I had a look at these, if you think about that racetrack analogy again, I looked at hundreds of examples of people telephoning mediation services to try and discover why it was that most people were saying no to this service and could I identify things along the way that seemed to get people to say yes more readily than, than other things. And I found lots of examples of things that mediators could do to better explain their service, but people were still resistant. But then I found this. So this is at the end of a call, and the mediator has explained mediation, and the caller is still resisting, as you're going to see. And so the mediator here is asking, does this thing, this mediation, does it sound like it might be something uh, that would be helpful to you? Does that sound like it might be helpful to you? Now, do you remember back with Dana and Gordon, we discovered that 0.7 tenths of a second was enough to tell us that there was going to be a problem between Dana and Gordon? So if mediation and whatever that these callers have talked about so far, if, if this caller was going to say, yes, that sounds like it might be helpful to me, make me an appointment, I'm dying to get into mediation, we'd expect that to reveal itself at line three. But this is what happens at line three. Uh, 0.7 tenths of a second of silence. So hopefully you now all know that this question about whether it's going to be helpful has not worked. And we're going to see the caller come back with something resistant, which is, well, it might be, but I'm not really sure about even you know, seeing this girl at all. Um, uh, it might be, but um, I'm not too sure at this stage about you know, how long you're seeing this girl yeah. at all. OK, so you can all hear that that's a no, right? <laughs> it's not a yes. They're, they're on the way out of the call. They're not likely to say yes to mediation. So. The mediator is going to come back with something that's magic. And I want you to notice the point, as the mediator does what she does next, where the caller comes back into the call. Because the caller is not going to wait for the mediator to finish saying what they say next before they come back with a complete change of heart and the most enthusiastic uptake to mediation that I ever saw across the, across the collection of recordings. So watch for the caller coming back in. Yeah, but you'd be willing to see two of our mediators oh, of just course. to talk yeah. about it all. Yeah, definitely. 
OK, so at line 10, the, med the caller comes back with, oh, of course, yeah, yeah, definitely. And she hasn't been asked a question. Some, the mediator has proposed something about the caller. Yeah, but you'd be willing to see two of our met is as far as she's got before the caller starts to respond. So the caller is responding to the mediator proposing that the caller is the kind of person who's willing to do something. Now, most callers say no to mediation on the basis that the other party is the kind of person who w won't do that. Because I'm, I'm lovely and they're horrible, and they're the kind of person you never get to say yes to mediation. But logically, therefore, the caller must be the kind of person who will. And this mediator's tacit expertise is revealed in what she does here, which is basically give the caller the opportunity to say, I'm nice, I'm willing, I'm the good one. And we can see how that works. And what's so special about the kind of work that Saul and I do and conversation analysts do is that this was just lying around in the world until someone bothered to record it, pick it up, say, oh, that's quite interesting. I wonder if I can find that anywhere else. So it turns out that when people are asked if they're willing to do something, that they've been resisting, they're far more likely to say yes than if they're asked if they're interested in mediating. So if someone's asked if you, they're interested in mediating, they might say yes, but it doesn't give them the opportunity in response to say, I'm nice, that willing does. I'm sure he would be willing to come in and see our mediator. Oh, yeah. I just wanted to see if you would be willing to attend a, a session as well. I'm more than happy to go down that way. Okay then, so would you be willing for two of our mediators to call around and talk to you about it all? Yeah, I'm more than Is that something that you would be willing to do? I would, I would be willing to do it, yeah. That's great. Just do anything just to try and get things done, you know. So we moved into other areas of mediation. We looked at family mediation and commercial mediation. And then we looked at business to business calls. So here is a business telephoning another business. And one business wants the other business to do something that sounds quite tedious with their mail. So for us to do this, we're asking businesses in your area if you'd be willing to send and receive two to four items of test mail on a weekly basis. You can also probably hear in the voice, even through the anonymization, that this person's got quite a strange voice, a sort of weird telephone voice. So it's not necessarily how cuddly and lovely you sound on the phone either. Sometimes words really do matter. Are you the kind of person who's willing to help us do this rather tedious sounding thing? Um, and it turns out, okay. uh, yeah, they are. That, that's fine as well. So I'm hoping that you've seen here in, in this sort of snapshot talk how important it is to actually study real conversation, not simulations, not in the laboratory, not kind of um, asking people later, what did you say, but to actually capture in flight, in the wild, actual talk, observe it, pick it up, find something that you can then train people to do that they, they, they were doing regularly but didn't know they were doing it. Sometimes things can really turn on a word. OK, that's, that's the end of, of my talk. Saul is now going to pop up and talk to you a little bit about the lab that we have um, over there behind the, the next stage. Um, and then we are going to hang out at the back um, and over on the lab if you have questions. But over to Saul. Thanks very much, Liz. Um, so I just wanted to ask you guys a quick question. We don't have time for Q&As, but I just wanted to ask how many of you have had a conversation with a robot um, telephone answering service? Just put up your hands if you have. And keep your hands up if that has been a satisfying and enjoyable experience. OK, one person. I just want to apologize on behalf of cognitive scientists and computer scientists everywhere who have produced these kinds of systems. And I think Liz's talk really gave us some insight into the tremendous complexity of what it would mean to be able to create a system with the kind of nuance and the kind of skills that people demonstrate in a very fluid way when they're interacting ordinarily. And that's what we're going to be looking at um, at our stall over by the Tokioki talk show. Some of you may have seen that. It's this round, donut-shaped table. Um, with a host in the middle on a swivelly chair. And you're welcome to go and sit down, but you should be aware that you will be recorded. And what we're doing um, is we've set up the world's first, well, the world's fourth, because we've done it on Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, which is why my voice is slightly hoarse. Um, the, the world's fourth 
live conversation analytic, um, capturing, transcribing, analyzing, and data sessioning experience. So you yourselves will get to experience what it's like to record thousands and thousands of instances of humans interacting, um, to look at that data, and then to try and come up with findings about this talk show. And of course, as Liz was showing you, most of the time we're analyzing maybe sometimes quite morbid things, um, like suicide prevention hotlines or um, air traffic control and pilot conversations where the outcome is really important that this conversation ends with option A rather than with air disaster or suicide B. We didn't want to deal with that kind of data in this environment because I think it would freak everybody out. Um, but we are looking at this, this rather fun talk show. So you can come, you can try and spot things that people are doing. Um, you can collect some clips of them doing it. We're capturing all of that information live. We're also streaming it to conversation analysts around the world. Um, and uh, you can just have a go at using this wonderful methodology. So um, I think that's all we had to say for now. If you wanted to talk to us or ask us any questions about conversation analysis or about Liz's work, um, using this methodology to develop uh, role play and training uh, systems for service encounters or doctor-patient interactions, then you'd be most willing to. You'd be most. Would you be willing to come and find us? You would be most willing to come and find us at stall 1051 Tokyoki. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Liz.